Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what you have done in the cross. With that being said, this, this coming week we get to celebrate a, a holiday where we get to stuff our faces with food. Uh, some of my most wonderful memories were at my granny's, which some of you got to meet the last time she was here. And taking in all that food, a table full, a house full, and just being able to be with family and celebrate. But how many of us, sadly, once a year, actually go to the Lord in deep thanksgiving? How many of us often forget the the more meaningful things of life in which we should be thankful for? Namely, the cross, the gospel, in which has set us free from the bondage of sin. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we should be thankful for that day in and day out. And that being said, that is what our text addresses today. So if you have a copy of God's Word, or whether it be a physical copy or an electronic version, I would invite you to turn to Colossians chapter 1 with me. Colossians chapter 1. This summer when I first got here, I began doing a deep study in Colossians, translating it from the Greek, spending just a few hours here and there, translating, working through the text, the syntax of it, everything that flowed with it. It was just deeply impacted my own heart. And that is why we are turning to Colossians today as a body to hear what the Lord says. So hear the word of the Lord from Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you. Since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. To let you in a little bit of the background of this this letter, this indeed is a letter written by the Apostle Paul and Timothy to a local church. It is written to a church. The importance of the church in the New Testament epistles is crucial because it was not written to individuals. So therefore, as we unfold God's Word today, keep in mind this is written to a body of believers, not specific individuals. So take it collectively as a whole for our body here at Calvary Baptist Church. This letter was written in around 50 AD. It was uh, written to correct a false teaching that apparently was going on. We don't necessarily know the details of that. Scholars' difference on what was actually the false teaching. But we know in regards to the letter how Paul is dealing with issues, that it is hitting on a misunderstanding of the Christology 
of Christ. That is the study of Christ. So it's, it's pointing out, here's the issue. Remember where you've come from. And here is the beauty of who Christ is, which we all need. So with that said, if I have understood this text rightly, the main point of the text, and therefore if I'm doing this whole preaching thing correctly, the main point of the sermon is this. Thanks be to God that the gospel is going out both here and to the ends of the earth. And may it continually be bearing fruit and increasing in us. Thanks be to God that the gospel is going out both here and and to the ends of the earth, and may it continually be bearing fruit and increasing in us. We'll look at this in two separate points. Paul's thanksgiving for the gospel and Paul's prayer for increase and growth. But before that, let's look at the greeting here. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So, Paul is simply drawing out that he is one who is sent out. That is what an apostle means, sent out by Christ, by the will of God the Father. He is not coming on his own accord, but he was sent out for this very task and purpose. And he includes Timothy, his beloved son in the faith, as we see was mentioned in 1 and 2 Timothy, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Again, he is not writing to individuals. He's not writing to just any old collective group of believers. He's writing to a body that has assembled themselves, promised to care for one another, to love one another, to live out the gospel in unity. They were members of this local church. Whether it looked the same as we do now or not, they were members of this church. That is something important for us to see as we go through this epistle. We need to understand it was to a church. Now the saints and faithful brothers in Christ, this being those that have already come to faith, that's all that saints means. That's all that it's saying, faithful brothers. But notice the relationship there. I'm thankful to have my brother and sister-in-law here with us today. But brothers and sisters, you're as much my siblings in Christ. That's how he thinks of this church. It's not just some loosely connected people he's writing to. He's intimately concerned about them because they are his siblings in Christ. He uses brothers in this translation meant specifically because it's Adelphos which is a masculine word, which is why most translations only do it brothers, but it means brothers and sisters. It means brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is who he's writing to. And his typical greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now moving on into our first point, Paul's thanksgiving for the church. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. We always thank God when we pray for you. It's not saying that he is not ceasing to pray and does never sleep or never does this or that. But anytime he's going to prayer, he's praying for them. Him and Timothy, they're praying for this beloved church. Since the moment that he heard of their faith, in Christ Jesus, and of the love that they have for all the saints. They've not stopped since that first moment of hearing of this faith in Christ. Notice how it draws out faith in Christ and love for all the saints. They're thankful because of this, that they've come to know the Lord Jesus, that they have a love carried out because of that faith. Galatians 5, 6 says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. These two go hand in hand, working together. If we have faith, we have love. It flows out of our faith in Christ because love was in what Christ did on the cross. But how does that love play out? 
Does it just say, oh, you know, I love you. I, I, I love this body. Sure, it's easy to stand up here and say that. But how is that love being played out in our care for one another? Brothers and sisters, how could he say because of your love for all the saints? Because he had heard it from Epaphras. It was being made visible in the way they care for one another and for the local churches in which they partnered with. It was made visible. It was manifested in what they were doing and how they interacted. So brothers and sisters, let if we say we have love for one another, let it not be simply in word only. Let it be made visible in how we care for one another daily. How we come alongside each other and lift one another up in moments of hardship. In love, even in the point if we see a brother or sister in sin that we're willing to say, Brother David, you are in sin and need to repent. And addressing it and calling it out rather than letting it slide. That is biblical love. But also notice who the faith is in. Who the faith is in. The object of that faith. It's not simply, oh yeah, I have faith in myself. Hey, I can do anything. I've got this. I've got faith in me. Or maybe for some of us, maybe not so much this year, but faith in Tennessee football or faith in this country or faith in whatever. The object is not simply faith. It is faith in Christ and Christ alone. Brothers and sisters, if we are not grounded in this truth, we've missed the bigger picture. Our faith must be grounded and rooted in Christ. Moving on to verse 5. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Now here is where my study was long enduring on this point. What is being given thanks? What is this grounded in in verse 5? Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Is it saying because of your faith and love, or because of the hope you have faith and love? It could be. The NIV typically translate it this way. But most other versions, the ESV, which I'm reading from, the Holman Christian, the New King James, all take it as grounding because of the hope is what they're giving thanks for. Because of a viable faith and love, they have a hope that is stored up for them. And this is the very reason Paul and Timothy are thanking God for them. That they have an inheritance in the things to come. Brothers and sisters, if you have faith in Christ, recognize where your hope lies. It does not lie in President-elect Donald Trump. It does not lie in America. It does not lie even in us. But it lies in heaven. That's where our hope is. Why do we get so narrow-sighted and, and forget to look towards where our focus should be? And that is what is to come. Why do people get discouraged who claim to be Christians when hard things come? It's because they've lost sight of where their true hope is. Brothers and sisters, look around at two families we have in particular that have been battling with cancer. Their constant faith in Christ is an example for us all. Sure, life is hard. It's not easy. But they've got their eyes set and keep thanking God and praising Him for what He's done and for their position in Christ. And that is worthy of all thanksgiving to God because God enabled it. God has allowed it for them to give thanks in what He's done in the cross. And of this they have already heard before in the word of truth the gospel. Paul is not telling them anything that they have not already heard. When they heard the gospel message, this is the message that they heard. He's simply reminding of them of what it is they have believed in, where it is they have placed their faith in. He's calling it to remembrance because of the false teaching that is creeping in, causing them to think that there's more to it. He's saying, no, this is it. 
This is the gospel that you have heard. This is the truth. Don't stray from it. Don't go into whatever false teaching is being taught here. Hold to this truth in which you believed. Be grounded in it so that you continue forward. Now, I love this in verse 6. This gospel, this truth, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing. Immediately, Genesis 1 should come to mind. Here's the words from Genesis 1, 28. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Then again, this same thing was repeated in Genesis 9, verse 1, after the flood. Why did God tell them in Genesis 1 to be fruitful and multiply? To reproduce image bearers of him. The same in Genesis 9, 1, after everything was destroyed and it was Noah and his kinsmen that were all that was left. They had to be fruitful and multiply so that God's glory could go out. The thought was they were to walk in the ways of God and be his image bearers. And it's saying this gospel, this truth, look at it. Indeed, the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing. This gospel is going out and having that very effect that was intended for mankind before the fall of creation. The gospel is correcting this. It's fixing everything that is broken in our world. Over the last few weeks alone, we've seen earthquakes, natural disasters. We've seen death. All because of a broken world. And the gospel is the solution to this. That's why they're giving thanks. They're giving thanks because the gospel is bearing fruit and increasing and going out to all the world. Now, does this mean that all the world is is reached in that moment? No. Remember, this is 50 AD. The known world at this point was maybe this small compared to what we know it today. Tiny, small comparison. As of right now, the International Mission Board statistics from September show 6,802 people groups that are considered unreached. That means they have little to no access of the gospel of Christ. 6,802 people groups. That's some 4.2% billion people that have no gospel truth. If this gospel is bearing fruit and increasing, how can we not be concerned about the gospel reaching them in time? How can we not be concerned with the gospel going out so that it can bear fruit and increase in those places? Nations like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, Thailand, Burma, Indonesia, Malaysia, Egypt, Morocco, Algeria, Somalia. All of these are unreached. They're hard to reach, but it is worth taking the gospel to because it is what bears fruit and increases, giving life to the hopeless so that they too may take part in what is stored up in the heavens for those that come to Christ. How are they to hear apart from the gospel? But how did this church hear the gospel? Why? Let's look on. The gospel is bearing fruit and increasing in the world and it's increasing in them. And there in verse 7, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. They hear because somebody went. Epaphras went and took them to the the gospel. Epaphras heard it most likely from Paul while he was working in Ephesus. 
And Epaphras was so moved by the gospel, he picked up, he went to the city of Colossae, shared the gospel, planted a local church so that the gospel could have its full effect. He went and he planted. Brothers and sisters, I'm not asking you necessarily to go to the ends of the earth. Maybe the Lord needs to move some of you. But what about right here in Bristol? In Bristol, Tennessee, in Bristol, Virginia. What are you doing to enable people to hear the gospel? Do you realize you all have more reach on people than Randall, Brad, or myself? Sure, we're the paid staff. But guess what? Hopefully, you know, if if y'all selected us correctly, we already had that faith. There's not a lost party person working with us. But what about you? Some of you who are working have access to share that gospel, to be a fellow minister to a co-worker, or maybe to a neighbor, or to a family member, a friend. You have that access. You have that opportunity to be a faithful minister of the gospel. What are you doing with it? Follow the example of of a Epaphras, and be a beloved fellow servant. Be a faithful minister of Christ on their behalf. And then share with the body what is going on so that they can know of the love developing in these people so that we can come alongside and link arms in sharing the faith of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, Paul was thankful for what God was doing through the power of the gospel. But when the gospel goes out, it doesn't stop there. Let's move to point number two. Paul's prayer for the gospel to continue working. Verse nine, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So not only have, from the day they've heard, is he thanking God for them, he's praying for them. He's praying for them as a body. To what? He's asking that they may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul is asking the Lord to to impart his wisdom, his his knowledge to them. But for what reason? Look at verse 10. Here's the reasoning. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Again, we see this idea of bearing fruit and increasing. Wait, didn't he say it was already bearing fruit and increasing? If he said it's already bearing fruit and increasing, why is he staying, he's praying for it again? Because the gospel doesn't stop having effect when you first come to faith. To quote a a dear brother and friend of mine, baptism, which we mostly, for some reason, consider the end of the journey of salvation, is but the beginning. Baptism is but the beginning of our journey in salvation. Because the whole Christian life, we are bearing fruit, we are increasing. As we're reminded of the gospel, we're built up in the truth of God. We're built up in the wisdom of God in order to walk in a manner worthy of Him and pleasing to Him. Turn with me if you have a Bible to Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. Hear the word of the Lord from Proverbs 2, beginning in verse 6. Give a moment. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity guarding the paths of justice and waiting over the way of his saints. 
Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of uprightness, to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. So you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death and her past to the departed. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. So you will walk in the way of the good and keep to the paths of righteous or of the righteous. Why do we need to increase in knowledge? So that that knowledge may guard our paths, that may guide us in the right ways that we should live, that we should walk throughout life. That's why it's important that we increase in knowledge and the wisdom of God. But how do we come to that point? How do we know the will of God? How do we get to know the wisdom of God. A couple of years ago, I found myself asking this very same question. 2011, 2012, somewhere, working for the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. The Lord's doing a work in me. He's stirring my heart. He's opened my eyes to, to missions and to the ends of the earth. My heart's swelling. I've got to go. How can I not go? to the ends of the earth with the gospel. So I'm asking, Lord, how do I do this? I've got a good job, good benefits. I love what I'm doing. I'm good without sounding arrogant. I was good at what I did. When you're able to look at your head coach and say, coach, he's good, in a matter of seconds of a player coming off with a broken equipment, you're not bad at your job. you got John Chavis breathing down your neck and you're able to still focus and do what you do, you're not bad at what you do. Because that's a hard man to please. Trust me. Been there. Done that. But the point is, I had to ask myself, Lord, what is your will for my life? Is it to go to the ends of the earth? Is it to make disciples amongst the unreached, the unengaged? What does this look like? How do I do this? It's like, First of all, knucklehead, knock, knock. Have I not given you something to seek my word, my will, my given word and will? In Proverbs, once more, in one seven it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And then in 2 Timothy 3.16-17, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. How do we walk in the ways of the Lord? How do we know the will of God and the wisdom of God? By opening up his given word. Has God not revealed his will for our lives in his word? So when it came to the question, okay, God, have you called me to go make disciples? Well, yeah. The Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. That's, that's my will for your life. Go make disciples. That was given. Do I walk in a manner of holiness? Well, yeah. Is that not given in First Peter? Do I not seek the ways of the Lord? Yes, seek the ways of the Lord and live from Amos 5. Those were the given. Now, there's other areas, decisions. Do I I go to Southern Seminary? Do I, I leave Southern Seminary and Third Avenue Baptist Church and move to Bristol, Tennessee? 
Those were all things that I had to look. Okay, what does the given word of God say? And where is opportunity? What does that mean? So ultimately, the Lord made that very clear. He closed every door but one. I'm still trying to figure out what in the world y'all were thinking in that one. But alas, I am here and praise be to God for that. But God made his hidden will clear as I sought his given will for my life. Brothers and sisters, are you seeking the given will before you start worrying about the hidden will? When you're trying to make a decision on how do I most glorify God, why don't you start by opening his word and seeing what he says is his call for your life. What he clearly calls is given to be a part of the church, not as Uh, forsaking to assemble yourself in Hebrews 10, to love one another, to care for one another, to equip one another. These are given. Make disciples, share the faith, live out the faith. Those are all given. And now use your skills, your talents, and your abilities to walk in a manner that is pleasing to God in using those. But as we continue, these are all pleasing to the Lord that we need to do. And these enable us, this wisdom, this knowledge allows us to bear fruit in every good work. It allows us to know what good works are as we seek the will of God. Therefore, let us walk in those good works that he has given us. It increases our knowledge as we open up his word, teaching us more of him. But notice this next part. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. All patience and joy. Brothers and sisters, why do we need strengthened? Well, if most of you have not already figured out by now, you soon enough will. The Christian life is not a life of ease. If you're looking for comfortableness, you don't want to come to the cross. Because the cross demands, take up your cross and follow me. That's the words Jesus used as anyone said, let me follow you. Or maybe it's, let the dead bury the dead. Wait, Jesus, aren't you supposed to be wanting followers? That doesn't sound very easy, does it? We have been misled in thinking that this is easy, but it's glorious. It is indeed glorious, as we will see. But may we be strengthened with the power of his glorious might for this difficulty, for this journey, for taking up our cross and carrying it daily. Let us carry that cross and the strength of his glorious might to honor and glorify him. Let us have endurance and patience. But wait, what's that next word? With joy? Wait, I'm supposed to have patience and endurance with joy? Huh. You know, somebody once said you should never pray for patience because it sure enough will be tested. Well, yeah, that is true. It will be tested. But how many of us want to have joy in the midst of trying to have patience? When everything seems going wrong, how many of us count it joy to endure? How can we endure? How can we count it joy? Where's our hope set? If our hope's in the things to come, Absolutely, I can endure. Absolutely, I can be strengthened and counted joy. James 1, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 says this. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Oh, Christian, may we be strengthened in such faith 
to count it all joy in the midst of sufferings and trials, that our faith gets to be tested and tried and proven. How many of you would get in a car if it was untested? Probably not many of you. There might be a few brave souls, daring souls. My brother probably won. But you're not going to get it if it's not tested. You don't want to use anything apart from it being tested, especially something that is to protect you. You don't want a doctor operating on you unless he's been tested and, and trained by other teachers, much less a pastor. Why do you think I went to Southern Seminary? To study, to be equipped, to be prepared, to teach God's Word more faithfully. The point is, the testing, the trying, shows where our faith lies. If you're crumbling in the midst of trials and sufferings, I want you to examine where is your hope, where is your faith. As brothers and sisters, I'm not here to make you question, but to strengthen and remind you of where that hope is. It's in the things to come. Stop getting so bogged down by the little details of life. Start putting our focus back in what we first believed, the hope to come in heaven. Have our eyes set upon it, awaiting and saying, Lord, I seek you. I want your glory for my life. I'm going to follow you, even if it means death, in order to follow you. Because my hope's not here. It's not in this weak, frail life that is short, but it is in what is to come. And that is glorious. That is where our strength comes. That is what Paul is praying, that they be strengthened with this power, with endurance, patience, with joy. But then in verse 12, it says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. I'm going to come back to this giving thanks, but I want to show you why thanks is needed. Listen to this. The Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. Brothers and sisters, why do we give thanks? Why should we give thanks? I think it's very clear. Has it not said our Father has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light? It doesn't say you qualified yourself. It says he qualified you. If you're here today and you're trying to get by on good works, stop. You can't qualify yourself in the gospel. The gospel is good news for a reason, because it is free. Repent and believe. This is the gospel. This is the gospel that brings you the eternal hope and joy. It is free. He has qualified us. How? How? He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Now, for example, that time of the month when bills are due, it's the most dreadful thing, but unfortunately we have to do it, transferring funds from our account to somebody else's to pay that bill, whether it's a car payment, a house payment, or mostly in my case, student payments for schooling. It's the most dreaded time. You hate seeing that money that you've worked hard for go immediately out, but it's part of life. The language of transfer is taking from one, placing it in another. That's why I use the example. He transferred us from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved Son. A transaction has taken place from the domain of darkness. But what is the domain of darkness? It's the bondage of sin in which we were all born into. Not one of us deserves heaven. Not one of us deserves 
and is pleasing to God on our own accord. Why? Because we're under slavery to sin. We're in bondage, in chains. We are left as Lazarus in the tomb, dead. A second, uh, my mind's gone blank. As Ephesians 2 says, we are dead in our sins. We can't bring ourselves to life apart from God's goodness and mercy. And He has qualified us, remember. And He has transferred us from that kingdom to the kingdom of His beloved Son. He has done that. Going back to the doing good works, increasing, bearing fruit. Brothers and sisters, if He has done this, if He has transferred you from the kingdom of sin, of slavery, of darkness, and you've been transferred in the kingdom of His Son, why are you still living like you're in bondage